So, hello everybody and welcome to another um, XRF webinar of our small Inside XRF webinar sessions. Um, this time we are going to talk about um, decision support for your sample preparation. My name is Susan Aschenbrenner and we will um, get a little bit into the topic of which sample preparation will be suitable um, for which sample and what to do when the composition is unknown. If um, during the webinar you have any questions, please feel free to ask them um, in uh, the Q&A section of, um, of the Zoom program. Um, if there's some time left, after the webinar, we will um, um, answer the questions live. Um, if there's no time left, um, I will answer the questions afterwards per mail. So um, please ask many questions. Um, and let's have a look into this topic. So what we, st we are starting with is a sample. And sometimes, um, we just don't know what exactly this sample is. The problem is we need an, um, an analysis of the sample in the end. And everybody who deals with XIF analysis knows that sample preparation is very crucial for this. So we really need to put some effort into this to get nice results and accurate results out of our sample. Um, so in the end, our aim is the analysis of the sample, but sometimes we are having some big question marks here on what to do with this sample in order to achieve the results that we need. What we exactly need, we have to, we have to clarify. And um, in the end, most of the time, we want the best possible results with the least possible effort. So what's our worst case? The worst case would be, I don't know anything about my sample. So I'm, I'm having a sample and I just don't know what it is. What I do know just from looking at it is if it is a liquid or a powder or a solid sample, but we will talk about solid samples a little bit later. So just from looking at it, I can already say um, what what um, what bigger kind of material this is. And what I can do with either the liquid or the powder is a visual check. So I can just look at the liquid. I can just look at the powder and have a look if um, if there's something about it that I recognize. Uh, about viscosity, about color in the liquid, for example, about different um, different phases, is there particles? Um, does the color already tell me something about the liquid? Um, look, does it look anything like something that I've seen before? Um, the same goes for powder. I can have a look um, into the particle size if I can um, obtain it by visual check. Um, I can have a look if there's maybe some metal parts inside the powder that I can already see with bare eyes. Um, I can have a look um, if, um, if the color of the powder, if it somehow looks familiar with what I'm analyzing um, um, throughout my, my laboratory day. Um, so this visual check can already give us a lot of information and um, most of the time, we still have to be sure what it is, just in order um, to, to analyze it properly. And to know exactly what it is, we need to measure it. But here, we are very confident that, we will, that a rough overview will be enough because we just want to know something about this material. We just want to know a little bit of information so that we can decide later on the sample preparation. So preparation in a cup without any pretreatment, without anything done before, 
will be enough here. So this is like the least effort I can do. I just take a, um, a sample cup um, um, that is assembled with a thin film or I assemble it myself with a, thi uh, with a thin film. And then I pour my liquid inside. I put my powder inside and then I measure it. For example, I can measure it standardless. Um, on most um, XRF devices, um, a standardless me method is pre-installed um, or you, you can order it with your device. And this standardless method with this very simple preparation technique already can give us a qualitative or semi-quantitative result. And this result, we can then take a, a support for the decision for our next preparation steps. If we are having solid samples, most of the time this can be measured without any preparation for this um, special case, just to find out what it is um, in a very rough overview way. Um, it just is possible to do it in this very easy way if the solid sample fits into our device or into our sample holder. So if it's, uh, if it's small or, or large enough to fit it into the holder. But then you can just take it and put it into the holder and measure standardless. And then we are at the point that we can say, I know which kind of material I want to analyze. I have at least some information about this uh, sample. And then um, the next question pops up. Um, how accurate do I want to analyze? So this actually depends on why you want to analyze the sample, um, for which reason you need the results. Is it a quality control? Is it just um, that you need to say it's this kind of material? Um, because something get, maybe get, got mixed up or whatever. This You have to decide how accurate you want to analyze your sample. And um, sometimes a rough overview will do. And if a rough overview will do, and we already did the, um, the standardless measurement of powder or liquid or um, in a cup or of the solid sample, then we are already done because this is a very rough overview. But most of the time we need it more accurate. And if we need it more accurate, this will not do. Then we have to take, um, take our time for the decision on uh, preparation and also for the decision um, on, on which measurement uh, technique I'm using. If I'm using standardless methods, if I'm um, using... Um, um, certified reference materials in my standardless method uh, to, to check the standardless method, or if I'm um, using a calibrated um, house method. Um, this is not the topic today, but this is also something um, that uh, you have to be aware of because it's also, it also affects um, the decision on your sample preparation. Um, but if we are rather free with this, um, we can now have a look on uh, how to prepare different kinds of samples and how to decide for different kinds of samples, how to prepare them. Let's first have a look um, onto liquids. Um, in most cases, liquids are the perfect sample for our measurement technique. Um, this goes for liquids um, that are um, homogeneous, and um, that, um, that can be just poured into this kind of sample cup and then measured. If it's this kind of sample and if there's like not a lot of phases in the sample, if there's no particles in the sample, um, then you, you will have a very easy job. Um, the only thing you have to do is choosing a cup and a thin film and um, the cup um, you will choose according to your device. So there's a lot of different cups um, fitting to a lot of different devices. Um, so if you, um, um, if you have a look uh, which cup fits your device the best, there will be one cup and um, this one will be the one that makes sense to use. And the film uh, you will decide on according to either the application you are already having or to the application that you are planning. 
there are different films. Uh, classically, there's uh, Myla and uh, polypropylene. Um, there is different thicknesses to these films and um, there's different suitabilities. So just to pick one example, the Myla, um, the Myla film will be rather suitable for gasoline, diesel and solvents and rather unsuitable for acids and bases, while the polypropylene is um, more suitable for the diluted acids and less suitable for gasoline and diesel. So in the end, you have to have a look like what kind of material do we have? This we already found out. And then we can decide on which, um, which thin film to use. Um, then we can also decide on the thickness, also depending on uh, how much the, um, the uh, material attacks your film and, and how stable your film has to be. Um, but this you can just test by let, letting the, um, the material sit in the cup for a while and just have a look um, how it behaves. And then the last thing you have to, um, have to consider is um, uh, impurities and that there's different absorptions for different films. Depending on the thickness and depending on the film, um, there will be different absor uh, absorption effects um, because there's the film in between your sample and 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 your your measurement um, measurement um, setup, and um, you just have to take care that you, that you don't mix up a lot of films. And if you need to take another film, that you consider the difference in um, in absorption and also the difference in uh, in impurities. And for these impurities, you would have to um, correct. If this is the topic that you are most interested in, there's another webinar in our, in our webinar series, which is analysis of liquids and powders. Um, it's the um, webinar uh, from May, 2021, and it's available on YouTube. So feel free to, to have a look um, if this can give you even more information on, um, on these uh, decisions that you have to take if you are measuring liquids. Before filling the, um, filling the liquid into the uh, cup, the liquid should be homogenized. Um, and sometimes you will have to dilute your sample. So if you, are, um, if you are having a sample that contains an analyte that is exceeding your calibration range, um, it makes sense to dilute the sample to then be able to measure it in your method. And um, so this is what this dilution step is all about. Um, and sometimes you will have to do special preparations uh, depending on, on what material you have. This is um, especially for uh, liquids with particles, for samples with multiple phases. So like waste, pro, uh, waste, uh, waste uh, liquid waste products and these kinds of stuff. Um, there you will need a special preparation but it is still possible to measure them with a little bit of effort and it works quite good. So when looking at liquid, we just heard that um, a homogenization step is needed and maybe um, dilution, also sometimes maybe special preparation, but this has to be um, looked onto in detail. And then it's very easy. You just prepare the sample in a cup and you're good to go. When you are having a solid sample, the world is completely different. Solid samples, um, they, they, um, are, the measurement of solid samples is very dependent on the surface of the solid sample. Actually, this goes for all the XIF measurements, but uh, in this case, um, we are not really having, um, having another option than surface treatment um, to alter the surface because we are having a, a solid piece of, for example, metal. And um, for metals, it is very important to, um, to do the surface treatment, uh, to grind the metal, to polish the metal. And there's um, also some other possibilities um, to, 
um, to treat the surface of the sample because the surface of the sample always has to be the same for all my calibration standards, for all my um, for all my me uh, measured um, samples. Um, I always need to treat them the same way before measurement. Um, since since a very um, very short time, Fluxana also has these um, these grinders in. Uh, we are having these grinders in our portfolio, so we are having a lot of information um, on on this topic. So if you are having the feeling that you need some more information there, please feel free to contact us. Then we can talk about your distinct sample and um, and how to uh, do the surface treatment for the sample. So we talked about solid sample a bit, and we said here we are mostly talking about surface treatment. The last part of this decision on preparation is powder. And powder is, is a little bit harder to explain than liquid and solid sample because we are having way more options um, for for the for the pretreatment and for the measurement than for solid and liquid samples. Uh, more options is is in a way good because you have more options, but um, there's also more options to decide on. So let's um, let's walk through it and have a look what can be done with powders. First of all, when we are talking about powders. Um, we have to consider if we need size reduction. Um, do we have to use mills and, um, and reduce the size of our particles? Um, the size of the particles of a powder, they uh, displays a huge, rule, uh, a huge role in trueness and reproducibility for our measurement results. So this step from in getting um, from a, a rather large particle size to a smaller particle size will considerably improve my measurement. And depending on the material and the material um, um, size uh, to begin with, there are different types of mills to get from, from a rather um, large particle size to a smaller particle size. If your powder, um, just from, from your production process or, or the powder that your customer gave to you is already fine. Um, you can skip the, um, the milling part. The nice thing about the milling part is um, that it's also homogenizing the sample. So this is uh, kind of a two in one, uh, um, one thing that you get there, like positive thing that you get there. Um, Reducing the, um, the particle size means that you are reducing particle size effects when you are measuring in a cup or in a pressed pellet. What are particle effects? Particle size effects. Um, you can see here in this, uh, in this scheme that um, with our XRF devices, we just um, can look into our sample until a, a certain uh, depth. And if our particles are rather large, for some elements, we can only see one layer of particles. The question here is then, is this layer of particles that I am looking at representable for the whole sample? And in most of the cases, this is not the case. Um, the smaller the particles, the more layers I am able to analyze. And this means um, the, um, the sample represents more of my total sample. And this gives a better, um, better representation of the complete sample than the larger sample size. Um, also, um, due to the reduction of the size um, in, in a fusion process, you have better solubility than if you have very large um, particles floating around in your fusion. But this is something you have to decide on. Um, there's a lot of people who are, who are then uh, talking about the correct sizing and uh, talking about distinct sizes and um, what, what, we, um, um, what we are actually saying is that um, 
that you can have a look with your bare eye if the um, if the sample has the correct size. If it's a little bit like flour, it should be enough um, for your measurement. Uh, this only goes if there's not some some norm behind uh, behind your measurement. Sometimes norms ask for um, for concrete particle sizes. Then then you have to be a little bit careful there. But for a normal measurement, um, you can see the difference. Um, yeah, and the um, um, the easiest way to prepare your powder again is um, preparing the powder in the cup. And this takes the least effort for the pre preparation, but it also gives the least precision and it gives the largest uncertainty. Why is that? We are having, um, on one hand, we are having this measurement depth uh, um, effect that I um, showed you in the last slide. And then there's also density effects because especially for very voluminous powders, um, we are we are having a um, um, a lot of air in between our particles, and this air also has an influence onto our measurement. The highest effect of all of these effects um, is on light elements, and the lighter the element, the harsher the effect will be. Um, fluorine is not measurable in a cup because we are having this uh, thin film parting our powder from our uh, measurement setup. And um, since we are um, just um, barely scratching uh, fluorine from, from the surface of our sample, the film is just in the way to do this. Um, but the heavier the analyzed element, the smaller are these effects. So you have to have a look. If your sample um, is um, containing a lot of heavier um, heavier elements and you just want to measure these and these are the most important um, analytes for you, then um, you might end if your if your powder has um, a good density when it is poured into the cup, then you might be in the position that you can say, okay, um, it's enough for me. The precision is okay because I'm just measuring the heavy elements. Um, so this is um, this is in the end um, it, you have to try it out if it's working for your for your material. Um, with this um, preparation method, you can measure main and minor components and with the corresponding uncertainty. So for these kinds of powders, a qu quite harsh. Um, high uncertainty. The next step you can take um, to improve your, um, your preparation work is to press the powder into pressed pellets. Um, this um, can be done by using um, manual machines like this one here where you really have to pump or um, with automatic machines that are pressing automatically. And uh, you can either press um, the samples with or without a binder if they are a binding by themselves. Um, there is a webinar um, that is pressed pellet versus fused bead. So if you're interested in pressed pellets or in fused bead, which will be the next topic we are talking about, um, I recommend to you to, um, to have a look on into this webinar. It's, um, it's also up on YouTube. So for the um, for the preparation of pressed pellets, you need a higher effort than just for the cup because you have to maybe mix it with a binder um, and then you have to press it to get this nice um, pressed pellet out of it. But the higher effort comes with a higher precision and a lower uncertainty. Why is that? It's because we are compressing the powder to a defined density here. Um, a big advantage of this um, of this preparation technique is that we need little or no dilution. So we just need a little bit of binder or maybe even no binder if, if my uh, sample can bind by itself. 
And this means we uh, have no large dilution, so we can measure main and minor components, but also traces. And if we are going one step further, we can uh, prepare our powders as fused beads. Fused beads are prepared in uh, these kinds of machines. Um, either it's an electric uh, machine like this one, but it's also, there are also gas fusion machines. It's also um, possible to just prepare fusions um, on a Bunsen burner by hand. Um, typically, the sample will then be diluted and fused in uh, uh, lithium borate as fusion flux and um, then is fused into this kind of glass bead. From just describing the process, you see that this is the highest effort you can do for preparation of powder. Maybe the sample even needs a pretreatment. Then you have to wait the time that, um, that the fusion lasts. And also there is, um, um, there's the cooling time. So this is um, the most time and the most effort that is needed for this preparation. But you also have the highest precision and the smallest uncertainty. And this is because of the, um, the total um, dissolved powder um, that is fused in the flux completely. So we are not having any molecular structures anymore. We are not having any particles anymore. It's really truly completely dissolved in this flux. And then we are creating by pouring it into a mold, a perfect surface and a perfect homogeneity. Um, here below, you can see a um, comparison between pressed powder and fused bead. And you can see that all the effects that we are having with pressed powders or just um, measuring in a, uh, in a sample cup, um, this, um, this is gone when we, are, uh, when we are measuring a fused bead, if we are preparing a fused bead. Um, the drawback in this is that a high dilution can be necessary and there's always a higher dilution uh, than we are having in pressed pellets. So uh, traces are rather hard to measure um, in a few speed. Um, for some elements, it's even impossible. And for some dilutions, it's also impossible to measure traces. So this will be more for main and minor components, but with the best uh, precision that you can obtain. Um, Another thing that is a little disadvantage about um, um, using fused beads is that the fusion can only uh, take place for, for oxidic materials um, or you have to perform an oxidizing step um, before the fusion process. Why is that metals and, and reduced, uh, reduced um, materials, they are a platinum poisons, they just harm the platinum wear. So then you have very, um, very bad pictures as you can see like this one below. So um, these crucibles, um, they, are, um, they are just going to, the, to um, have to be replaced. Um, and this is because of um, a metal sample that destroyed these crucibles. So as I said in the very beginning for the visual check, um, it makes sense to have a look if you can already see metal particles. If you're not sure about your material, um, it makes sense to test, um, test before if there's metal particles in there. You can, for example, do it like we do it. Um, we are um, taking these quartz crucibles. You can um, use an adapter to fit them into the electrical fusion machine. And um, you, um, you just prepare the sample as you would in the platinum ware but you don't pour after the fusion process. So you can obtain and, and have a look onto the melt uh, inside this crucible. And you can see in this case, there we are having a lot of metal particles and here we don't. So this one would be okay to fuse in platinum, this one better not. So, in the powder, then we are talk, We talked first about particle size reduction and why you um, would be, sometimes it would be better to do it and sometimes it's, it's okay not to do it. Um, then 
the question is which preparation technique can be performed by my lab because maybe you don't even have all these possibilities and then you have to decide if to measure in a cup as press powder pellet or um, as uh, uh, um, performing a fusion so short summary um, we said we have a sample and we don't know anything about it we want to perform a good sample preparation so that in the end we are having a very nice result out of our XIF spectrometer. How to do this? If we don't know anything about our sample, then we should perform a qualitative um, or semi-quantitative analysis to identify the material. This can be do done standardless and the preparation should be as easy as possible. Afterwards, I do know uh, which kind of material I want to analyze. Maybe I already knew it before. And then I need to ask myself the question, how accurate do I want to analyze? And if a rough overview will do, I'm already done. Or if I already knew which kind of sample, I need just to go this branch and analyze now in a very easy, fast way. Most of the time I will need it more accurate and then I have to do the decision on preparation and measurement. And this decision depends on which uh, kind of material I have. If I have a liquid, I have to think about preparation in terms of homogenization and dilution. For special liquids, um, there might be a special um, um, a preparation necessary, but then I can prepare just in a cup and I'm good to go and measure. For solid samples, I need to think about surface treatment. And for powders, I need to think about particle size reduction, maybe, maybe not. And then I have to consider, do I want to um, prepare in a cup as a pressed powder pellet or in a fusion process? And this decision, if I have all these options, this um, on one hand depends on how much effort am I willing to take for the accuracy? Because this is like least effort, but also least accuracy. And then it, um, it ends with a lot of effort for a lot of accuracy. And the last question I have to ask myself for the powders is in which concentration range do I want to measure? If I want to measure traces, um, I'm kind of bound to to do pressed powder pellets um, this this will be the best way then um, for main and minor components i have plenty options and then i have to combine these three questions with each other to then have a good de decision on what to do there so this was rather long <laughs> thank you for your attention um, next month uh, on August 17th, uh, there will be a webinar on the ASTM norm C114 uh, to 18, which is a standard test methods for chemical analysis of hydraulic cement. Um, same time, same place. Um, with a quick um, look onto the time, um, I would say um, uh, maybe take another minute um, to, to text uh, questions. Um, and if you are having questions uh, later, you can also just uh, write an email and I will answer all the questions, um, upcoming questions per mail. Thanks again for your attention and have a very nice day.